Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, oh, I'm not allowed to move. Um, I'm going to be speaking about what's here. I'll try not to read my slides. Um, so uh, if I read my slides, it's called um, the redundancy effect of cognitive load theory, which means you'll remember less if I read them than if I don't read them, so I won't. I also have quite a lot of pictures, uh, and um, they're all uh, uh, allowed. Um, I'm going to be talking about 21st century skills, and actually that's really strange because I'm actually talking about something that doesn't exist. Uh, and how you can talk about something that isn't is uh, a problem in itself. Um, I've tried a number of times to uh, find good definitions of 21st century skills. Uh, this is the closest I could come. Um, and if you read it, you immediately see one of the first problems with 21st century skills, because they describe skills as comprising skills, abilities, and learning dispositions. So they're actually, even the people who define 21st century skills really don't know what skills are and aren't defining it really very, very well. And um, if you see that it's um, needed for success in 21st century society. Um, okay. I'm going to go into uh, a couple of the problems with 21st century skills, why they're not skills, why they're not 21st century, and what you actually need. Um, if you go through the short history of 21st century skills, you begin in the year 2009 with the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. And uh, you see it's a, a fairly simple uh, picture of what it is. Um, they're also very uh, generally uh, uh, defined. And the skills are on the top, and on, on, on the bottom is what you need to achieve them. They think, okay, that's really good. Uh, that's 2009. We're in 2019. Um, at a certain point, not very long after, you come across this. Uh, the Alberta Cal uh, Canada Ministry of Education uh, came up with this, but there are also quite a lot of others that look like this. And all of a sudden you see it's getting a little bit more intricate. It, it's still more things that you need to be able to do. Um, I'll be getting into the fact of things like creativity and innovation, if that's actually worth anything. But um, we'll go on a bit. Say something. Something. Something more? Something more? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I do what I'm told. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, that evolved, thanks to uh, two groups in the Netherlands, into this. Um, you don't have to. Uh, a lot of you can read it. Um, it's partially in English, partially in Dutch, and it looks a little bit like Swedish. Uh, but all of a sudden, you see that it's become even more intricate uh, when we look at what it is. Then I found uh, this which starts out with the first one, but now splits out what they all are, so that we hopefully understand them better. And you see that we've gone from uh, four things to four, seven, 12, 17 things. But as if that wasn't enough, uh, we ended up with, uh, we, we, we came here and uh, here we have uh, also 16, 17 different things. Uh, and now we have foundational literacies, competencies, and character qualities, which are now uh, apparently defined as skills. And if we go uh, a step uh, further, we end up with this, which has now 22 different 21st century skills that uh, we have to achieve. So the first problem with 21st century skills is that nobody really knows what they are. 
A lot of people are saying we have to do it. A lot of boards of education, even here in Sweden, from what I gathered yesterday, say that uh, schools should prepare students and teach them 21st century skills. But um, for me, in any event, it's not quite clear if I, I, I'm an instructional designer and a curriculum designer uh, by trade from years and years ago. And the first thing that I learned is if I have to achieve something at the end, I have to know what it is and have to be able to define it. And apparently 21st century skills are undefinable. And I'm going to go into a, a, a couple of problems with these 21st century skills. Um, they're here. I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to read it, but you can break them into uh, three major groups. Um, the first group ask the question, are we really talking about skills? And if we're not, uh, what are we talking about and can we actually teach it? Uh, the second is, are they really 21st century? Or have we been teaching it all along and maybe don't know it? And the third, if you look at it, um, you see the fact that almost all of them uh, are seen as being domain independent, as if you can learn them without knowing something about the area in which you're going to use the skill. Okay. The first thing is that if you look at the skills, you see that a number of them, actually many of them, are traits. A trait um, implies a kind of more or less permanent presence and a, a stable level. Um, they refer to the uh, state, consistent, they're enduring. It's kind of like something that's baked into the person. We know, if we look at uh, traits, that they're very, very, very hard to change. And they're almost impossible to teach. Um, That's something that's quite different from a state. A state is a state of arousal at this moment, and you can motivate someone to do something. You can make someone at the moment happy. But we're not talking about it. We're talking about things like uh, creativity and innovation and those types of things, flexibility, leadership. These are all traits of a person. And you have a major problem with that in that you can't teach someone to be a leader. You can't teach someone to be innovative. You can't teach someone to be creative. You can't teach someone to be flexible. The only thing you can do in a school is you can create an environment that hopefully will facilitate that trait and in any event, an environment that doesn't stop or hurt that trait. And let's just take an example of that. If you want someone to be creative, to come up with a creative solution, if you want someone to be innovative, if you want someone to think outside of the box, you have to create a situation which is so safe that the child, the person, is willing to be creative and think outside of the box. That means you have to create a classroom climate in which if a child or an adolescent or even an adult comes up with a creative idea that you don't do anything to stop that. That you don't say something, no, that's a stupid answer, or no, Johnny, that's wrong, or no, you should have done it a different way. If you do something like that, what you do is you'll make sure that that person will not try to come up with a creative solution, an out-of-the-box solution, the next time a question is asked. Why? because that person got very negative reinforcement. You can almost call it that they uh, uh, 
received a punishment. They were humiliated in front of the class. They lost um, uh, uh, status in the eyes of the other children. If you as a teacher try to create a safe, psychologically safe environment, you also have to make sure that the environment is safe also in terms of what the other children do. If that child comes up with an out-of-the-box answer and is laughed at by the other kids, chances are that that child won't come up with a creative out-of-the-box answer the next time. The same is true with flexibility. The same is true with leadership. All of these things cannot be taught. You can teach people, and th th that's one of the major mistakes in it, you can teach people certain things about what a leader does. A leader is open. A leader uh, uh, allows for other opinions. A leader uh, will uh, lead by example. You can teach them all of the different aspects of what it means to be a leader, what the characteristics are of a leader, but you can't teach them to be a leader. You can't teach them to be creative. If you want to create that environment, that means when someone comes up with an answer that might not be good or might not be the best, best you have to use certain type of feedback to achieve that, and that's called epistemic feedback. What is epistemic feedback? Epistem oh, sorry. Epistemic. Hmm? No, let me think. I don't know how to use a an apple. Okay. If we look at feedback, there are basically three types of feedback we can give. The first type of feedback, you can call it single loop feedback. Yeah, It's corrective. That's just what we normally come against. Okay, this answer is wrong, it should have been this. Okay? The second type of feedback deals with the how, and you can call that double loop feedback. Because you don't give feedback directly on what the answer was and whether, whether it was correct or not, but you give feedback as to how it could have or should have been done. This type of thing, no, the answer is wrong. You should have done it this way. The child learns something from that, but also learns that there's only one possible way and that's the way you tell them to do. Epistemic feedback is triple loop feedback that gets to the why. That's the kind of question that you ask in terms of, now, I didn't expect that answer. How did you get that answer? Did you think about this or that? Could it have been solved differently? What would have happened if you would have taken this and that into account? All of these different aspects gets the child to think. It gets the child to come up with new ideas, new thoughts, understand how it could have been done differently, maybe even with an idea as to why his or her creative solution or flexible way of looking at it might be even better than the way that the teacher originally thought it was. But you've created a climate to allow creativity, flexibility, innovation to happen. You give them feedback, but then the most important thing is you have to have them do something with the feedback. If you get them to think about how it could be done differently, you have to then let them try to do it in a different way. Most of the feedback that we see, if it's with relation to what students have done, in relation to homework, in any event, in the Netherlands, it ends up in their book bags, at the bottom of their book bags, that they clean out once every month or once every two months or even at the end of the year. And the reason that uh, that's the case, and the reason why people often say that homework doesn't work, is because the teacher doesn't do anything with the homework. The teacher doesn't do anything with the feedback, and doesn't require the child to do anything with the feedback. The second is uh, 21st century. Um, this is the Tigris River. Oh, I'm not allowed to walk there. On the right-hand side is the Tigris River. 
On the left hand side is uh, uh, the Euphrates, uh, that's called the Fertile Crescent there. And in about 6000 BC, a very strange thing happened. There was a person, probably a man, who noticed that certain types of grass yielded certain types of seeds, and those seeds could be stored. And he or she, probably a he, started crossing grains with each other and eventually ended up with wheat. Incredibly creative, incredibly innovative. But what it also did is it changed society at that moment completely. It created a society in which the hunter-gatherers could stand at one place and didn't constantly have to move to find new grains, new food to eat. By staying in one place, they formed communities, they formed trades, they formed professions. That meant they could divide labor amongst different people. Some people could bake pots, other people could grow food, other people could make clothing and things like that. And in order to do that, you also need to be able to pay for it. So we got currency in its most primitive form. You had to have records of who bought what from whom. People started trading. Those are incredibly creative, innovative, entrepreneurial skills that these people were doing 6,000 years before the current era. But if you look at all of those skills, those 21st century skills, they don't differ very much from entrepreneurial, being creative, being innovative. I mean, they went from a spoken language to a written language, thanks to this. They came up with numbers, and we're talking about something that was 8,000 years ago. These 21st century skills of collaborating, communicating with each, with each other, entrepreneurship, they're 8,000 years old. What are we talking about? And I won't even go to the previous century. I mean, if you're talking about creativity, one of my favorite things to think about is my grandmother. Why? My grandmother was born in 1890 in the United States. When she was born, in the period of her life, she lived to be something like 75, 80 years old. Within the period of her life, she saw horses replaced by cars. She see, saw candles replaced by electric lights. We s she saw musical instruments replaced by phonographs and then radio. She saw the telegraph being replaced by the telephone. She saw buses and trains and airplanes and even somebody landing on the moon. Those are incredible steps that we made. Those are incredible changes, incredible innovations. The most creative minds were busy with that at, the, at that point in time. They were working together, collaborating. They were in communities of scientists. We're now talking about the 21st century. What have we actually seen in the 21st century? We've seen a large computer get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and even smaller. But how many actual earth-shattering changes have we seen? We went to the moon in the 60s. Since then, we haven't sent a man any or a woman anywhere else. Yeah? Um, the jet, the, 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 the 747, I saw it in the newspaper today, is a plane from 1970. Since then, yeah, we have an Airbus 380, which is going uh, bankrupt at the moment, but hypersonic, supersonic, not very many changes. And if there are changes, they're in changes of degree. They're not radical. They're not like going over from a candle to an electric light. They're not like going from a horse to a car, let alone getting to the moon. So, 
Actually, those 21st century skills were incredibly important in 6000 BC, but also incredibly important and changed our world from the time of 1880, 1890, up through the 1950s. Um, uh, there are groups of economists who are showing that our uh, economic growth, which was incredibly large in the first half to the first 60, 70 years of uh, the last century, has gotten less and less and less and less because the innovations in what we're doing have become one of scale and not of type. Next problem. Let me watch the thing. Do I have 40? Um, it's 10 to, yes. Um, finally, the major problem is that the skills that they're talking about, and those are skills of problem, things like problem solving, um, they speak of them as if they're domain general. But there's a problem there. Domain general skills don't exist. And I know what people are thinking. We have, uh, uh, if you um, um, do a piece of research, then you first observe phenomena, then you uh, 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 have a hypothesis, then you think of a method, then you carry it out, then you analyze it, then you conclude it. And you know, that's a domain general skill because you do it in biology, you do it in chemistry, you do it in physics, you do it in, 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 in psychology. Uh, some people even do it in economics and things like that. But what you've learned is a procedure. You have procedural knowledge. If you know nothing about biology, you can't carry out a biological experiment. If you know th nothing about psychology, you can't do it. The definition of a skill is the ability to successfully carry out a procedure. But in order to successfully carry out a procedure, you need domain-specific knowledge. And if anyone doesn't, uh, still thinks that uh, domain general skills like problem solving exist, um, first question is, are there any quantum physicists here in the room? How successful do you think you'll be coming up with a creative solution to a problem in quantum physics? Yeah, not even Casper can do that. Yeah, he, he was my one hope that he would be able to do it. The same is true for chess, for checkers, for any other generic skill. The most you can hope to do is teach someone a procedure of how to do something. But as I said, all that ends up being is procedural knowledge. You need domain-specific knowledge in order to be able to carry out the skill. This here, the working definition here of a general skill is, uh, for example, not bound to one domain. Uh, it's loose from domain knowledge and skills, and it's applicable in other domains. I mean, even if you look at some very specific skills like playing a board game like chess, a chess master is as good or as bad in checkers as I am. Although it's using almost the same board, although um, you have to make use of strategies and tactics in it, although you have to move pieces, knowledge of chess might help you learn to play checkers or drafts better, but the skills there don't transfer to it or to Go, or to any of Mahjong, or to any of the other types of board games. So actually, they're not much more than procedural knowledge. There are certain second-order skills that we have that you can try to teach people, like self-regulated learning and uh, self-directed learning. Yeah, I'll come into the information skills, uh, I think, a little bit later. But that's a very small segment. And just let's look at them, because what we're doing at schools now, in any event in the Netherlands, is there's this great hype that 
kids have to be self-regulated and self-directed learners. And we should make use of that. But first we have to say, what is self-regulated learner? Uh, a self-regulated learner um, orients him or herself to a problem, makes a plan, monitors his or her progress, and finally, tests whether or not he or she has reached the goal. And if that's not the case, the cycle begins again. A self-directed learner, you see on top task, that's the first one on the top. But a self-directed learner is actually goes a step further. It's kind of the macro level. It's kind of like, I want to learn quantum chemistry. So the first thing you do is you determine your learning needs. Okay. Then you determine your learning goals. And then you determine the learning materials that you need, and then you carry out the task. So we go back to the previous page, and that's self-regulation. There's one small problem with respect to self-regulated learning and self-directed learning. The only people who can self-direct and self-regulate their learning are experts. Experts know what they know, know what they don't know, and know how to get that knowledge or information that they don't know. A student is by definition a novice. That student doesn't know very much of what it know, he or she knows, but has no idea what he or she needs to know. And if he or she doesn't know what he needs to know, he doesn't even know what is available to be known within a domain. So how does that person determine his or her learning needs? How does that person determine the learning goals? And how does that person find and determine the proper learning materials to learn it and then to carry out a task? I often compare it to... Um, let's say uh, you go to uh, uh, Moscow, you don't speak Russian, you, don't, you can't read Cyrillic, you don't have a navigation device in your car, and someone tells you to find the nearest shoemaker. Yeah? How, do you, how do you do that? How do you plan your route? How do you monitor your progress? You can test whether you found it after driving around 45 minutes and still not finding a shoe store or a, a, a shoemaker, actually not even be able to read the sign on somebody's storefront that he or she is a shoemaker. So as you see, if you don't know anything about what you're doing or what you're supposed to learn, it's very hard to be self-directed and self-regulated in that learning. And that's only at the individual level because when we're talking about working in groups and working in teams, collaboration, which are the 21st century skills, it's not only about self-regulating your learning, but it's also about co-regulating the learning of others and socially sharing the regulation within a team. And this is kind of the reason why that doesn't work there's an incredible, we know since, you know, Mickey Chi actually did the, the, the research, but before that, it was Ade de Groot in 1965 who did research on, oh no, actually 1946, if you look at the Dutch version, 1965, the English version, when he looked at uh, what makes master chess players master chess players, it's not that they are smarter, they can think differently or whatever, they know more chess moves. They know more chess boards. They've seen all of these different games and they can, it's in their long-term memory and when they see a chess board in a certain setup, they know what the next step will be because they have more domain-specific knowledge. They're not better problem solvers. They're not more creative people. They know more and because they know more, they think differently, yeah? They don't have to remember 
what the steps were to do something, it comes by itself because it's been done so many times. Things have been, tra uh, 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 have been transferred and they work forwards. It's a hard thing to understand. With a novice, it's completely different. They don't have those schemas. They don't have those, uh, 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 a way of automating it and so. Each step has to be remembered. That takes time, that's hard, yeah? There's very little cognitive capacity for the problem solving because all the other things are new and your short-term memory, your working memory is small, yeah? And uh, they work backwards and that's a hard thing to understand. Working forwards and working backwards because it sounds like the exact opposite of what I'm going to say to you. But working backwards means, okay, uh, we have a patient and that patient has, uh, 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 it, it comes in and says he has a problem and a novice doctor will then go step by step through all these different types of tests to finally determine what the problem is. Yeah? So you say, oh, that person is working forwards, but that's called a means-ends anal analysis, and it's called, in our terms, I would do it differently, uh, that's called working backwards. What does an expert do? And think of the television program House, yeah, it, for those of you who know it. Um, what he does is House comes up with a possible solution, then says there are one or two things that which will prove whether this solution is good, We'll try that out, it's called doing a differential. You would say, well, then he's working backwards, that's called then working forwards in this terminology, yeah? But solves it in a completely different way. But we're talking about children. We're still back in those 21st century skills, and now I have to watch my time, yeah? There are certain 21st century skills, okay? After I've now told you there aren't, I'll tell you there are, yeah? The first one is information literacy. Yeah? Why are there actually two 21st century skills? Because up to the year 2000, when the internet exploded, the World Wide Web exploded, we had search machines, the precursors of Google, for example, um, up to that point in time, if you needed information to do something, you went to a library. In the library, there was a librarian. There were encyclopedias. The librarian was the gatekeeper. He or she was the guarantee that the information in the library was valid and reliable. I won't get into rewriting history and Stalinist Russia and things like that. In general, in our part of the world, we could conclude that the information that we were getting was valid and was relevant. With search machines and things like that, all of a sudden, we had a completely different problem. Those were called information problem solving problems. Information literacy. Yet searching for information is easy. You type in a term and you find a heck of a lot of information. The problem comes going through it, processing it, and organizing it. And actually, as I said in the prior slide here, that's from uh, 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 Saskia Brand, you have to be able to identify, evaluate, and effectively use the information. That was something that prior to the year 2000, wasn't necessarily a skill that we needed. You needed library skills. You had to be able to use the Dewey Decimal System, yeah? And you had a library in there to help you. But you didn't have to do all of those other things. The other one is information management or curation. And that's, how do I deal with all of this information? I don't know how many of, how many of you come up with this problem. But I myself often have. I remember I found it somewhere. Where? Or I remember I saved it to a folder. But where? 
All of those folders are incredibly idiosyncratic. If someone else gets behind your computer and doesn't know your idiosyncratic system, system is completely lost in your computer. So while we used to have just this, and that was arranged in the Dewey Decimal System or alphabetically or whatever to find it, we now have this. The information management skills that we can store it, find it, and use it, that's something that didn't exist. Those are the 21st century skills that we have. If you want to read more about educating kids for, 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 for non-existent or not yet existing, um, it's open access. You can go to um, this, uh, look up this uh, article. Uh, I did a piece of research with uh, Slavi Stoyanov on what we need to do in our schools to do that. And the answer is not very much. <laughs> I'll get into that in a, in a second. I'm going to go through these. What we have is um, you can do one, you can use scripting, but scripting were very specific. You learn to solve one problem, but it's hard to transfer to another. Or you can make use of second order scaffolds. I did a piece of research with Omid Norozzi on this, in which you not only give support and guidance for carrying out the problem you have to solve, but you also give support and guidance for the more general skills like self-directed and self-regulated learning, but within the causes of a specific domain, specific problem. This is what it looks like if you want to de 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 design it. Um, and that comes from uh, this book, 10 Steps to Complex Learning, in which we discuss, Jeroen and I discuss uh, how you get this done within the solving of whole authentic tasks. Uh, what should you do? I call that future-proof learning. You need for children today to forget the idea that everything can go be Googled. Forget the idea that there's knowledge on the internet because there isn't. There's information on the internet. And most of that information is pure squat. Okay? What you need to do is create a very broad and deep skill base. You have to attend to flexibility. I'll give you a simple example. I can teach you how to bake a cake or bread or puff pastry or whatever. I used to be a cook. I still am actually, but I, that used to be my profession. And you can do it really, really well here in Haninge or in, 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 in the Netherlands. And you think if you're done with your uh, baker's uh, course or, or, or curriculum that you've learned what you should learn and you can then bake bread or whatever. But if I send you to my sister who lives in Crested Butte, Colorado, and you try to bake your bread, it will fail. Why? Because my sister lives at 3,000 meters altitude. And we taught these bakers how to bake at sea level. And we didn't include in their education the fact that the air pressure goes down as the altitude goes up. That's why all world records in skating are at Calgary and in Salt Lake City, because there's less air pressure there. You can cut through it more. But there's a problem if things have to rise. It's a problem if you have to cook things. Water boils at my sister's house at 85 degrees. Try making spaghetti. Except if you use a pressure cooker. But that means in the teaching, you have to teach them to be flexible. You have to ask them the epistemic questions like, is there a situation where this won't work? Huh? Why wouldn't it work? Well, think about it. If you were doing that in Chamonix. Chamonix, where is that? Switzerland. Oh, it's in the Alps. If it's at a higher altitude, does that make 
some type of a difference, and hopefully they've had the basics of physics and chemistry. And in that way, you get them to think about it and be flexible and to understand that what they know today isn't enough to carry out their job, let alone in five or ten years in a situation where there are new jobs that we haven't even thought about. And I think the best is, uh, my favorite, recognize the usefulness of useful, useless knowledge. Because that useless knowledge, those facts that we've learned, are very, very handy when you're confronted with situations that you haven't been taught for. Um, go to listen to David later today, but this is David Dito's idea of how you do it. And as you can see, it's all based upon what you have in your own long-term memory, the knowledge that you have. And with the knowledge that you have, you can then solve problems, think critically, communicate, collaborate, and be creative. That's the basis. Please talk to David about the fact that it should have been the other way around so that it was in the foundation. This um, just was recently uh, a, a letter from Australia's chief scientist to a 10-year-old girl. And in that letter, he talks about actually the 21st century skills. And he ends with, there is no substitute for our knowledge even in the age of the internet search. After all, there's no use learning to la collaborate if you don't have anything distinctive to contribute. If you want to read about um, other myths than 21st century skills, uh, you can read it in uh, this book, I Want Moderne Mieter om Lerende Och Utbildung, Bildning. Yeah? And um, there's... Uh, one of the other authors sitting in the back there, Casper. Pedro isn't here this time. Um, there's a uh, second version coming of it, and hopefully, uh, Natur ook Kultur is going to be uh, publishing that also in Swedish uh, for people. If you um, have a bone to pick with me, because I wasn't allowed to allow you to ask questions because it was being uh, uh, filmed, um, you can get in touch with me via my email or you can tweet to me and I'll usually end up answering in a direct message because I don't like gigantic threads on Twitter. I don't find it the way to converse with other people. You can get in touch with me. Um, that's about it and I'm sorry I was three minutes too late. Now, if there are any questions, they can be asked because that won't be part of the. Excuse me.